Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. And welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. A teachable lesson for Missouri education. A Johnson County Republican gets a lesson in party loyalty. And Kansas drivers get a lesson in patience, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and focus on the gubernatorial race in Kansas as primary election day, August 7th, approaches. Joining me now is Democratic hopeful Josh Swatty, a former state legislator and former state agriculture secretary. Mr. Swatty, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. You've been away from government service for a while. What has tempted you back in this year? You know, I had the opportunity to run the State Department of Agriculture, which was a real honor, and it gave me a great sense of the dedicated civil servants that helped make our government work every single day. And so for the last eight years as I've been away, I've watched that be dismantled. And guess what? No surprise, Kansans are really feeling it. Uh, you know, usually when they start feeling government's not functioning well, it's largely around K-12 education. But now they see it in a new headline almost every, every day. Incidents at prisons, uh, lost children in the Department of Children and Families. And that stems largely from the diaspora of quality state civil servants. And so I said, we've got to put this back together. We have to fix the state and felt like I could do it. And you were agriculture secretary because you have a rich background in farming and you still are involved, are you not? Uh, I do. It's funny you use the word rich. I'm not sure right now any of us have a rich background in farming. <laughs> a lot better than a poor I know, background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I, I understand what you were saying. Yes, my family's been farming in central Kansas since the 1860s. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I actually, as we stepped away from public service, began to build our own farm there uh, eight years ago. And it's been, it's been a real struggle like other Kansas farmers around the state. But uh, one that we love, and it's certainly something that we want to leave as a legacy to our children. This is going to be the first competitive Democratic primary for governor since the late 1990s. Is that healthy for the party or unhealthy for the party? I think it's very healthy for the party. Uh, however, you know, the party has to kind of relearn that muscle memory. Republicans are used to paying attention at the end of summer and getting out and voting in the primary. Democrats, we're having to say, hey, don't forget. It's not just the general election this year. You need to be paying attention. There's a lot of important races coming up in just a couple of weeks. Who would you prefer to run against if you're the nominee, uh, Kobach or Collier? You know, when we got into this race, we didn't know who was going to run. And, and we, we still don't know. And we still don't know who's, who's going to win. We and... always felt that we were the most compelling Democratic ticket. That being said, I think for sure my ag ties in western Kansas would suit me very well if it was, say, Secretary Kobach. And we saw the Senate president yesterday endorse Sec Secretary Kobach. It feels like he is trending toward being the nominee, but we just never know until that primary happens. Quickly, what would your three top priorities as governor be? I think, first of all, we have to stabilize the state's finances uh, for all state agencies. Uh, second, we have to take some proactive actions to improve the overall perception of the state. I've, I've talked about reinstating the civil protections for LGBT state employees on day one. One, because it's the right thing to do, but two, because it sends an immediate message that the open Kansas of our history is back. Uh, and then three, I think that we have to sort of launch uh, this idea of next generation of leadership um, for the state of Kansas. Kansas is ready for it. Kansans want it. Uh, but that means drawing in a broader, more diverse spectrum of Kansans to help run state government as we rebuild these agencies. It's going to be crucial. Have any desire for an income tax increase or a tax increase of any sort? I think that we probably did, uh, and I wasn't in the legislature, but I think mm. the legislature probably visited its largest tax increase for a long time in this last session. Uh, we won't revisit it again for a while. And if we do, uh, my biggest push as governor will be to either reduce or eliminate the sales tax on food. We're the but, highest in the country. Of course, whether they face it again or not may depend on the state Supreme Court and uh, its positions on uh, education. I think so. And, you know, I certainly don't speak for the state Supreme Court, but I think that they're probably looking for another 100 or $200 million, you know, that cost of living adjustment that they asked for. And we actually have enough coming into the state right now to handle that over the next two years. I think we'll be all right. 
Apparently, your biggest problem with many Democrats is your position on abortion. You are pro-life, not pro-choice. Is that a fair reading of your position? That's probably not a fair reading of my position. I did vote that way when I was in the House. Well, I've, how would you define your position? I, I've told people now on the campaign trail I'd veto any new restrictions on women's reproductive rights. And I also, I think it's important to look at my overall spectrum over the last 10 years. You know, I marry a strong, independent woman and now have placed a strong, independent woman who has control over her own body on my ticket. Uh, I think that we represent that kind of balance that exists all across Kansas. We kind of represent the middle of Kansas. That strong, independent woman you married as a lobbyist uh, for the city of Wichita and perhaps for others, would she still lobby if you were governor? You know, I certainly don't ever tell my wife at all <laughs> what she can do. But, of course, uh, if we were to win the gubernatorial race, there'd be some uh, dramatic uh, decisions and changes in our lives. Well, certainly yeah. she would lobby you. Uh, you know, I think that... Uh, one thing I love about Kimberly, and she's actually a Johnson County native, has grown up watching Ruckus, uh, is that she is very intelligent, runs uh, an incredible business that she built on her own, and largely uh, a good old boys network. And so um, she, uh, as many people know on the campaign trail, uh, brings as much energy and vitality as anybody else. Got to stop does. you there. Thanks very yeah, much yeah, for coming yeah. in. That is Democratic gubernatorial hopeful Josh Swatty. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jason Grill is the founder of J. Grill Media and a senior advisor at Paris Communications. Attorney Laura McConwell is the former mayor of Mission, Kansas. Jamika Kendricks is an educator and education activist. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Welcome to all of you. The Kansas City Star's Influencer Series recently ran a story dealing with education issues in Missouri focusing primarily on teacher compensation and performance. Among the influencers who weighed in are some frequent ruckus contributors. Crosby Kemper III calls for elimination of a master's degree requirement for advancement, suggesting instead master teacher categories. Urban League CEO Gwen Grant wants districts to invest more in professional development, coaching, and better work investments. Woody wants schools to pay teachers for performance, not years on the job, and he wants increased pay for good performance and termination of bad teachers. Well, as someone in the trenches, Jamika, what is your reaction to the influencers' comments and the story in general? I think all of those comments are great and worthwhile. However, I think the thing missing for the influencers was actually speaking to or hearing from people who are currently in the classroom. Because a lot of times in the conversations about um, professional development, about training, about recruitment and retention, those teachers are left out. So how do we know why they're not there? And as a teacher, most of my colleagues are not interested in increased pay. We are interested in professional development that actually helps us to improve our craft. And a lot of times the things that folks who are outside of the classroom come up with are not necessarily those things that we need. And so actually listening to the people who are doing the work and including them in the conversations about recruitment, retention, preparation, all of that is hugely important. So um, I agree, professional development, um, even if we're looking at master teacher training or those effectiveness measures, you need to talk to the folks who are there about what might be included in that instead of just coming up with something from those folks so, who have so not been So you're saying there. none of the influencers are people in the classroom or who have had They're not experience currently in the, in the classroom. So they've had experience. There are but some as school, you know, things are, change over but time. There are some school administrators among the influencers. And I actually read from some school administrators and some of them who I know and I was disappointed because they talked about pay as being one of those really significant issues. But teachers coming into the profession already know that. It's been an issue for 20, 30, 40 years. So they know that there's low pay. They're coming in because they want to have a positive impact on kids. Woody, let's talk more about your idea to pay good teachers more and get rid of bad teachers. Will that be a problem to implement in Missouri? Oh, yes. Uh, the most powerful lobby in Jefferson City, as in most state capitals, is the education lobby. And so if you want to do anything about performance, if you want to do any kind of major reform in public education, the odds of you're actually getting it done by passing a law are very small. You know, uh, I, I, Jamaica and I agree. I think people know when they go into this profession that they're not getting rich. Yeah. And uh, you, you take the top five states out of this, we're where 40% of the states are. We're paying 47,000 a year average. 
forty percent of the states are paying between forty-five and, and fifty thousand a year. The the I hear this from people that you just just raise the pay and we we'll get good teachers. If that's true, then we've gotten bad teachers up till now because we're not paying enough. So why would we pay these bad teachers more money? I, I don't think, I'm with Jamaica, I don't think it's just a question of money. I think there are teachers who are in there busting their backs to do a good job, and then there are some who aren't, and those who aren't need to go. Uh, Jason, you're an influencer as well, and you made some comments about education. I think you said the cost of education for students, uh, college education, yeah, yeah, is I, the I most think, serious problem. I think they, they make us list out our top five or six issues, and I think that higher education is just insane what it costs for like a year at a at a university these days. I feel I feel like there has to be solutions to that, and also I think it has to become more uh, innovative. Education is, to me, is not innovative. It's not entrepreneurial. Uh, some of the things Gwen talked about, I thought were really good: professional development, technical, vocational skill sets. I just think it's all changing. I think. With what Woody said, I think it's unfortunate that uh, some of the stronger lobbyists, education lobbyists, aren't willing to adapt to change with what's happening in our society. Well, Lord, I don't think it's an unwillingness to adapt to change. I think it's an issue of if you're going to say we're going to measure teachers, well, how are you going to measure them? And if you're not a person who understands what's going on in that classroom, you might come up with measures that aren't actually measuring what you needed to for students to improve. And so sometimes it's not about innovation or being resistant to change. It's about if you're doing it, do it right. Well, I, I, I was going to say, I, I, you got to have the, the the teachers in as part of that whole conversations because they're the they're the front line. They're the the men and women on the streets working with those kids. And I think you also have to have some of the stakeholders with with some of the families because there are some of the families in the underperforming districts where school was not a safe place for those mm -hmm. parents. And you have mm -hmm. to help give the parents skills as well, which is where the whole early childhood education mm -hmm. piece comes in, and have it be a team effort and you know, the, the, and I sometimes see the union being a little bit of an impediment to that because they want to speak for all the teachers. And then, so you have this, so some of the teachers are concerned because they don't want to go against the union, but they don't want to against, go against the employer when all they want to do is, is mold these young people so that they can be our future leaders of tomorrow and have them learn, have them learn. And all right, we've got to wrap this up. Police Board Chairman Leland Shuren suggest paying teachers a hundred thousand dollars a year to attract the best teachers in America to Kansas City. Uh, first, is that a sensible position? And secondly, does he think police officers should be compensated as well? Well, since he's understaffed and letting his staff of uniformed police plummet in numbers, maybe he ought to pay attention to recruiting and retention of police officers. <laughs> uh, Jamaica, finally and quickly, if teachers don't leave because of low pay, why do they leave? It's because they don't have the support they need to improve their craft and have the impact they want. And because a lot a lot of times you're having to come out of pocket to provide supplies for your students that you shouldn't have to, um, that should be provided by the district. All right, we have to move on. From time to time we hear of political mavericks, office holders who buck their party's candidates or policy positions. A local example is Kansas State Senator Barbara Bollier, a Mission Hills Republican who recently announced her support for a Democratic congressional candidate in the 3rd District, Tom Neerman and her plan to vote for Democratic gubernatorial hopeful Senator Laura Kelly if Kelly is her party's nominee in November. As a result of her actions, Bollier has lost her leadership role on a Senate committee, and the state GOP has promised retribution if Bollier seeks office in 2020. So how should other Kansas Republicans regard Bollier's actions? Let's ask one. Laura? Well, I'm I'm a little disappointed on um, I, I, with with Barbara. I don't I don't agree with her position, but you know what? I think it's her position to take, and I do think the First Amendment as well. I'm extremely disappointed in the state party because it sounded like the state party executive director was trying out for the Wicked Witch of the West, and. Um, you know, you need to let your voters in your district take care of that rather than continuing to eat our young in the Republican Party, which is, I think, a real problem. And, you know, in the district that Barbara's in, she's she's my state senator, she, she votes the district. And, you know, she's got to be responsive to her constituency. Um, I did read a lot of the, the comments talking about how we, 
you know, you need to vote for whoever you want and it's all about the person. Well, that's not exactly how the system's set up because you have, that, that may work really well at local government and interestingly enough, I don't care what party you are, when you're at local government, most people tend to be the most conservative. So. Well, was there any reason she had to make her preferences public? She could have done whatever she wanted. There was no reason to come out and tell the public what she was going to do. No, there's there's no reason for that. Uh, so did she have a motive for doing that, do you think? You know, I, I I think that I, I do see that you know Barbara is she is she it has very strong positions and opinions and she's really willing to share them so it's irritated you know a lot some of the leadership and I think she's just tired of feeling like she's under their thumb and she's going to say hey this is what I am and let it all hang out. Woody, did you have any experiences like this when you served as the chairman of the Missouri Republican Party? No, I never had anybody say they were going to vote for a Democrat. I had people who were. Uh, you know, for example, pro-choice. Uh, uh, and, and I would have people come say to me, well, you shouldn't support her for re-election. Say she got an R by her name and uh, we're going to support her for re-election. Uh, I, I also agree, you always sound like the wicked witch of the West if you threaten retribution. Don't ever threaten it, just do it. Don't say, I'm going to get you. Just get them and well, move and on. Well, little dog, too. And, <laughs> and so, I, look, you and I and people of a certain age, as they say, can remember when we were all calling for realignment because the parties didn't mean anything. You didn't know what you were voting for. Well, we got what we asked for, and we got it in carload lots. You know today what these parties stand for, and they're pretty far apart. And if you believe the things she believes... You should be voting for the Democrat for governor, and you should be getting out of and the Republican And run for office well, as, well, as, a, as a Democrat. I, I don't believe no. Barbara's a Democrat. Thank you. I, I do not, but Barbara is not a Democrat. She's a Republican. She's just not as far right and conservative as the party leadership is right now, which is why I don't think Barbara's leaving the party and going to be a Democrat. Jason, you, you were an elected official. No. You were a state elected official, Missouri state rep. Uh, do elected officials own some, owe some loyalty to the party? Uh, I don't think them? so. I, I don't. No, I, no my loyalty at all? I was very Republican. I was a moderate Democrat. And I think my last session I voted like 50-50 with Republicans and Democrats. But that's just the way I am. I think the extremes are way too extreme these days. Uh, I think she should support her district, vote her district knock on doors in her district, talk to her well, constituents. Well, she was and, elected as a Republican. We assume the district no. is Democratic. Did you ever endorse a Republican? I did but, not. Publicly. No. But she so, didn't so say point, but. that she endorsed Democrats because she was Dem a Democrat. She endorsed the Democrats because the Republicans are not representing their well, constituents. And she said this person doesn't come out and talk to his constituents. And so Kevin I'm going Yoder. to support somebody. Yeah, Yoder doesn't. So I'm going to support somebody who does. This is a person who I believe is actually going to represent the people they're elected to represent. And I think politicians get it mixed up a lot of times because they begin to represent a party instead of the people People that elected them and well, so I think what she is doing is actually great because it's telling people in the same way that voters did in 2016 by Bernie having as much support as he did and Trump we are tired of people voting for parties or or towing a party line at some point you've got to listen to the people who put you there and it's not your party. final question does the media applaud mavericks of both parties I think so oh, yeah. she got a pretty good editorial in Kansas City Star she for did. her comments didn't she Instead of getting a driver's license, a lot of Kansas residents are getting instead a license to kill, time. Long lines have become commonplace at the two Johnson County offices, causing applicants to wait for extended periods, sometimes outside in brutally hot temperatures. And what's the problem? State officials say the summer onslaught of teens getting their first permit or license. There's also the real ID requirement that takes extra time. Or it might be the new sign-in system that replaced the old one that worked. And on and on and on. Officials are expanding office hours and plans are underway for a third office to ease the lines in Mission and Olathe. But aren't these issues that should have been foreseen? Is there any legitimate excuse for these problems, Jason? Uh, not all of them, I don't think. I think that the two offices is insane for that population having 600,000 people in Johnson County. Worked have, for years. Yeah, well, uh, the federal government also implemented the Real ID uh, deal here lately. Uh, they also have, like you said, all those other reasons. But I think that the appointment system getting messed up was a, a lot to do with it. I think that that makes a lot of sense to have that appointment uh, technology and system. And I will say this, Mike, I want to throw this in there because I've been wanting to talk about this for years. 
the DMV is like the worst place to go, right? Nobody, some entrepreneurs, some government have to make it a cool place to go. You, you put TVs in there, you fix it up, the carpets always look bad in there, there's holes in the wall. Somebody should actually make the DMV a comfortable place to hang out at and go to, and we wouldn't have all these four negative... Year, four years ago, I went to the Mission <laughs> DMV to get a driver's license. I was out in 10 minutes. My wife went there in mid-June. She was there three and a half hours. Is there any excuse for that? Well, you know... They're, they're addressing it. Unfortunately, the, you've got people that are elected and people that are in, in, the, in the bureaucracy who do not necessarily appreciate what the public sort of whip tail is going to be on the elected officials, and they're working hard to, to get it addressed. I went last year to get my driver's license renewed, and I was it didn't take me very long. I mean, the system we had was fabulous. I think they're working to get it addressed, to work on the lines. I also know that there's been a big uptick even though Johnson County's population has been growing and they know that there's been a huge uptick in people coming to get their driver's license, a lot from Missouri. We were discussing schools yes. and it's, you know, schools start in August, which may be. Well, and then and then the whole, um, the real ID that people don't know what they want to bring. So I did bring copies from the Kansas, um, Kansas Department of Revenue. You can get these on the Kansas Department of Revenue, which is your checklist. And you do not have to get a real ID if you're not traveling. You can just get right, your license. You can go license. back at a subsequent time after you get your license. You can go back later and get the real ID added to it. And that doesn't take effect at the airports until 2020. Right. And, the, and that's time. what I intend to do once this brouhaha kind of passes. Well, Jimmy, isn't there a positive side to this, that in the future these offices will be prepared when summer arrives and, as happens most years, teenagers get out of school and apply for their driver's license? Who knew? We would hope yeah. so, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And I don't think, as um, <laughs> Lori, Lori and I were discussing, or no, Laura, no, Laura. Laura. I said Lori. I'm That's sorry, okay. Lori. That's okay. okay we'll, so change, as, we'll change her name. Yeah, no, fine. don't do that. <laughs> okay, so as Laura and I were discussing earlier, with um, what I think something that couldn't have been anticipated that um, we thought about as we were talking is a lot of times families from Missouri move to Kansas when it comes time to move their kids into school because Kansas takes care of its more affluent schools or schools in its suburban districts. And so families are moving over there. So there may be some people or an influx of folks who are coming in to get Kansas IDs because they're moving their kids. Um, and so I think there are some smaller things that you may not be able to do. It's easy to say in hindsight, oh, we should have known. But um, in the moment, it's kind of hard to predict some of those things. Uh, any of these problems in Missouri that no, you've experienced? No, because we don't have state revenue That's offices. right. It's, they're individuals, right? If you right? wanted three more offices in Johnson County tomorrow and it was run under Missouri government, you'd put out three RFPs. You'd get private companies come in. They pay the rent. They pay the overhead. They do everything. You give them one, a, a buck fifty a transaction or something. And they take care of it. We do not have this problem. The offices are scattered all over the map wherever there's a demand for them. Right. Uh, it, it, and it costs us less and we get quicker service. Yeah, if I remember correctly, a few years ago there was a problem at one oh, yeah. or two of the offices and like that. No, Those changes were contract. made, and yeah, they, they lost their yeah. contract, and the but situation But can't they make was... them nicer, though, Woody? Let's just, let's well, just focus I, on that. His can wife would have nice been happy for nice three hours. Well, you you, the you open well, a fee well, office and do it that way, and we'll see how it works. It doesn't cost any more to use pretty paint, right? Right. Than yeah. All right. Uh, it is time now for us to head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to opine, define, or malign, and we start with Woody. Uh, I want to thank uh, in, in my roast, as I'm roasting him and his fellow police commissioners, Lee Shuren, for sounding off on what we ought to pay teachers and thereby putting his name in play. Uh, City Hall and the Board of Police Commissioners, at the end of 2013, we had 1,427 uniformed policemen in Kansas City, Missouri. Today we're down to 1,337, nearly 100 fewer officers today. Uh, we were understaffed at 1,427. The murder rate is through the roof. This is absolutely unforgivable. If anybody runs for mayor or city council and doesn't put this at the top of the things they talk about, don't vote for them. Lori? Oh, Lori. Oh. <laughs> so I am going to toast uh, Ronnie Metzger, who is our Johnson County Election Commissioner, and I am holding this sign up so that if you don't know 
who to, where to go find out your voter ballot lookup. You've got the website. It's jocoelection.org. I have the phone number. You can pause on your screen and come back and write it down. There are no excuses. Go vote, go vote, go vote. I'm tired of hearing about the whiners and complainers who complain about the kind of government we're getting, and you don't vote. Come on, folks. Get with it. Shamika. All right, I wrote it down so I can be fast this time. Okay. Don't be too fast. Oh, okay. Don't overdo it. I'll slow down a little bit. Well, okay, so I am toasting the 135 current teachers who have tapped into their power as influencers and are running for 111 legislative seats across the country, including 13 in Oklahoma who won their primary races on June 26. 10, um, uh, hold on, 17 in Kentucky on the Kentucky State House ballot for November. Um, including R. Tavis Brenda, who defeated Jonathan Shell, the Kentucky House Majority Floor Leader, in a GOP primary, five running in West Virginia's general election, and the Johnson County teacher, Tom Nearman, who was just recently endorsed you by Barbara. You better be brief, Jason. You better be brief. We had a couple principal visits, president, vice president. There's been many throughout the years. I want to toast the people that do the advance work, logistical work, the Air Force, the pilots, the police, the, the Missouri Highway Patrol. They get no recognition unless something goes wrong, and they do a lot of work to put on those types of events and put those principals in Kansas City, so toast to them. And finally, here's a rose to political phenom, Democratic Socialist Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. While campaigning in Kansas City, Kansas last weekend for Democratic congressional candidate Brent Welder, she said this. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be hopping on here, uh, Senator Sanders' account, and we're here in Kansas City to rally for Brent Welder. We're going to flip this seat red in November. No, 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 no. You meant blue, which means Democratic. Red means Republican. Red states, blue states. Of course, now that I think of it, red can also mean communist. And that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.